Welcome to a Field Trip Toolbox video. You can visit us at fieldtriptoolbox.org. So, so the plan for this morning is that I'm going to uh, talk you through the statistics um, lecture, like the methods that we're using for, for doing statistics. And I, I know that many of you will have already ha have had statistics in, 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 at university. But the way that we're doing statistics is rather MEG specific, or EG and MEG specific. So that's, that's why we uh, want to explain this as well. And it's a, it's a, it's a method that we started developing um, at, like about five years ago, and, and, and it has picked up quite a lot of attention within the field of MEG. Um, and it's about non-parametrical statistic, statistical testing with clusters. Um, the outline of the talk is that I'll very shortly recapitulate what inferential statistics is about. So, so I tend to make a difference between inferential statistics and, uh, and descriptive statistics or modeling. Uh, inferential statistics is about making decisions. Um, then I will spend most of the time explaining the method using channel level <coughs> data. Uh, but towards the end, I will go to, sor to the source level and I will explain how, how sa the same mechanisms can be done on the source level. And already yesterday we've been mentioning these, these common filters quite a few times. So I'll again be explaining what the relevance of these, of these common filters are and, and why they uh, also pertain to statistics. But let's start by inferential statistics. So what we have is we have a, an observation and we want to find out basis on the basis of that observation whether some uh, hypothesis uh, holds. Actually, this should have been a, an alternative hypothesis. So usually we start with the null hypothesis and we're interested in showing that the alternative hypothesis holds. So what we do is, as first, we, we make observations. And then given those observations, we look at the distribution of the data that we've observed. Uh, and given, um, please come on in. I, I just started, so you only missed the, the overview. So given the, uh, the observed data, what we do is we uh, usually we compute the mean, we compute uh, the variance or the standard deviation, and then we determine the probability of this distribution given a t-score under the null hypothesis by comparing the mean to the hypothesized mean uh, given the amount of uh, variance that, that's in the data. And if the t-value that we've observed, if that's uh, sufficiently unlikely, then we reject the null hypothesis is in favor of the alternative hypothesis. So statistics, inferential statistics like this is a way of helping you to make informed decisions about hypotheses. Um, quite often we don't have a single observation, but actually we have an experimental manipulation in which we observe the brain while the subject is engaged in a task, while the subject is engaged in a, in, in a task with multiple experimental manipulations. So rather than comparing to uh, uh, an a priori assumed mean, we often compare the data that is observed into experimental conditions. Um, the idea is the same. We have a distribution of the data in condition X. We have a distribution of the data in condition Y. Uh, we compute the t-value between them. And if the t-value is unlikely given the null hypothesis, that the data from both conditions is from the same distribution, then we reject the null hypothesis in favor of the alternative one. OK, so there's a problem with this, and a problem pertaining to MEG data, and that is that um, it requires a known distribution of the test statistic. So this is, this is nice if our data is normally distributed, but actually quite a lot of the, of the analysis that we're doing on, on the MEG data cause the numbers to be not normally distributed. Power is not normally distributed. Connectivity values are not normally distributed. Um, so that means that the distribution of the data is, 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 is not nicely known like this, but it's, 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 for example, it can be skewed towards one side. It has, it has tails which are very different. It might be clipped, like coherence values can never be larger than one, which means that it cannot be normally distributed because it's, it's clipped at one. Um, so there's, there's, there's many of these, these values that we're looking at, that we tend to look at, which cannot be normally distributed. Um, so that means that we're violating the assumptions that are required for, for, for a, for a t-test, for, for an f-test. The second problem that we're facing with MEG and with EEG is that of multiple comparisons. So let's look at a single channel where we have a time frequency decomposition, uh, 
frequency along the horizontal axis, uh, sorry, uh, frequency along the vertical axis, or time along the horizontal axis. What we actually have is we have many observations in this time frequency plane. So for many time points, we have estimated the power at many different frequencies. So let's say that we have uh, 16 frequencies by 30 time points, that we have in total that we have 480 points at which we have observed a value over multiple trials in multiple conditions, which means that we're going to do 480 statistical tests. If we test 480 statistical tests with a false alarm rate of 5% for each single test, sorry, then we actually have a chance of getting at least one false alarm that is very close to 100%. So with so many uh, statistical tests, we would expect 24 false alarms. Of course, this assumes, like this computation assumes that all of these tests are independent, which they're not. Like we have spectral leakage, so we know that different frequencies that we're estimating are statistically not independent from each other. We also know that neighboring time points are not independent of each other because we often have these overlapping sliding time windows. But we can also not claim that they're, uh, that they're exactly the same because there are different features visible, so there is some independence in the data. So although the problem might not be as severe as 24 false alarms, the chances of having a false alarm is actually much larger than the 5% that we're allowing ourselves uh, in, in, in reporting these types of findings. The problem that gets even greater if we look to whole brain analysis. So let's say that we have a Neuromax system with 306 channels, 100 time points, 50 frequencies. This is only like a time frequency analysis of channel level data that gives uh, one and a half million statistical tests, uh, which means that this is the number of false alarms if we were to assume that all of these channel time frequency points were independent. So the multiple comparison problem is, is, is a serious problem for, for MEG data. Um, of course, there are multiple solutions to address the multiple comparison problem, and the one that you're all familiar with is the Bonferroni correction. Um, so the, the idea with Bonferroni correction is if we have two tests and if the chance of having a false alarm in total should be 5%, well, let's make the chance of having a false alarm in each of the two tests 2.5%. So we just divide the alpha, the threshold, by the number of tests that we're going to perform. The problem is if we're going to divide alpha by one and a half million, then we need to have a really strong effect in order to find it. So Bonferroni, although it's, it's correct, it's not very sensitive, which means that the chances of us having uh, not being able to report the effect, although there being an effect, is also very large. So Bonferroni, is scientifically, it's not a very smart way of, of, of going around uh, if you have channel level time frequency analysis, uh, uh, analyzed data. The second method uh, that is used a lot is uh, the false f using the false discovery rate, the FDR. Uh, using the false discovery rate, we're actually we're not controlling the number of false alarms, but we're controlling the expected proportion of false alarms. And it's considerably more sensitive than the Bonferroni correction. But the, th the, the third way, and that's the way that I will explain in more detail in the remainder of the talk, is to use a Monte Carlo approximation of the randomization distribution of a, a statistic. And the statistic that we're using is the maximum statistic. Like in all, all of these, all of the words in this sentence will become clearer in the, in the remainder. To just give you a, like a little feel for how that's implemented in field trips, so we have uh, functions for statistics, such as FT time lock statistics, and what you can specify, you can specify the method, which is the method for computing the probability. And then you can specify the, co the correction for multiple comparisons that you want to use. So with an analytic computed probability, which is, for example, based on t-scores, and using a Bonferroni correction, this is how you can configure the function and get a Bonferroni corrected uh, probability. FDR is basically the same. The only thing that you change is the cfg.correctm uh, field in the configuration. And if you want to do a Monte Carlo statistic, so rather than specifying analytic, you specify that you want to use the Monte Carlo method for estimating the probability. And you can specify that you want to use the maximum statistic for controlling for false alarms. What you see here is that I'm 
showing FT time lock statistics. But basically, we have three functions that serve as entry points. So we have FT time lock statistics, F FT frag statistics, and FT source statistics. And the functions, they only differ in the way that they do the, 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 the data bookkeeping. The, uh, the underlying machinery is the same for the three functions, um, but it's, it's basically just different data structures that they, that they take. Clear so far? Okay, so the general principle of a randomization test is that we consider the data. We have an independent variable and we have a dependent variable. So the independent variable is the one that you've experimentally manipulated as the condition in which you observe the data. And what we assume is that the data depends on the condition in which the data was observed. So that means that we can phrase a null hypothesis and the null hypothesis that the null hypothesis is that the data is independent from the condition it w in which it was observed. So the null hypothesis is basically the brain is doing whatever the brain is doing, but it doesn't really care about the stimuli that you were presenting. And you can, you can rephrase this and you could say the data in the two conditions is, is not different. Um, and if we believe this null hypothesis, well then we can basically, we can, t we can use this schema. So we can take the data in one condition, we can take the data in another condition, we can analyze it and we can compute some sort of a difference. And the analysis that we, for example, perform is the computation of the mean value and the computation of the variance or the standard deviation. And the difference is, for example, computed by taking the difference between the means divided by the estimate of the, of the standard deviation. So that means that we get a, a number out, and this number is the, is the statistic. Um, but under the null hypothesis, we can actually, we can shuffle the data over the two observations. So rather than keeping this data here and here, I'm just going to shuffle between the two pools. And I'm again going to compute the mean and the standard deviation. I'm again co com going to compute the statistic. And that is something that I can do many times. And for every time that I compute this statistic, I'm going to store it. And I'm going to make a histogram out of it. And afterwards I can, com I, I, I can look at this histogram. So that's the Monte Carlo approach of sampling this distribution. So it's the Monte Carlo sampled distribution or the randomization distribution of the statistic of interest. The interesting feature is that I don't have to make an a priori assumption on how this distribution is because I'm estimating it from the data. And that also means that the distribution can take an arbitrary shape. So it can be skewed and it can actually it can be random. But what we expect is that under the null hypothesis, the statistic that we observed given the data in our original assignment of the data should be somewhere in the middle of this distribution. And if the statistic that we've observed for the original assignment of the data over the two conditions is in one of the tails of the distribution, then actually we consider the null hypothesis to be very unlikely. And we would reject the null hypothesis. So this is, this, this, this is, ba this is independent or this, this does not depend on the distribution of the, of the statistic. We're estimating this, the, the, statistical dis the, the distribution of the statistic and we look whether the observed statistical value falls in one of the two tails of this distribution. Is this clear? The nice thing is that although we can like compute mean and we can compute variance, but the procedure does not depend on what we're doing in the analysis. So basically we can plug in any black box and as long as we have our data, and as long as we're computing some sort of a difference, the procedure holds. Because the procedure does not make any assumptions about the distribution, the procedure only makes an assumption about the similarity of the data over the two conditions, because that's the null hypothesis. So you, you, you can, for example, compute the difference as the, the, the difference between the mean divided by the standard deviation. Okay. Or you could also just compute the difference in the means. Yeah. You, you can compute a ratio, you can, a anything. Like, uh, um, you um, usually we would do permutation, okay. but, it, but it, it, it depends on how the experiment was designed. So usually we would permute the data that was observed in each of the conditions over the two possible conditions. So that means that, like y yesterday, we've already shortly touched upon, like, how do you deal with um, experimental designs where you have uh, different trial numbers in each of the two conditions? So let's say, let's, let's 
give, uh, give, uh, let's assume that we have, uh, we have observed the data in 100 trials. We have 70 trials in this condition and 30 trials in this condition. As long as I keep the number of trials in each of the two conditions the same, but I sh just shuffle the data between the two conditions, I'm always going to keep 70 trials here and 30 trials here. That means if the numbers that I'm computing, the numbers that I'm analyzing in this black box, say coherence, uh, if those numbers are biased, coherence is biased by the number of trials, like the fewer trials, the higher the coherence will be, then also that bias is going to be reflected in, let's say, the difference in the coherence. Like the, the condition with 30 trials is always, under the null hypothesis, it's always going to have a larger coherence. But that means that the randomization distribution is actually going to reflect this bias as well. So that means that if we permute, we don't care about the bias, as long as we keep the same number of observations in each experimental condition. So that's why we normally permute. Uh, it's also possible to randomly reassign, but that's the, um, but that's the, we, 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 the field trip can do that, but we general, we, we in general, we, we permute. Permu the permutation is just a subset of randomization. Usually we do approximate permutation because the number of permutation is too large to do an exhaustive search. And that's also why we call it a Monte Carlo approximation of the randomization distribution, because we're only taking a subset of all the possible randomizations. Um, there are cases where the number of permutations, the num number of possible permutations is not that large. And in, that, in those cases, we will actually do a, uh, we, d we will compute all possible permutations. So bo both are possible, it depends on like this, the, si the size of your sample. Is it possible? Yeah. Okay, so the, yeah. Well, it, 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 the more permutations you do, the, the, the better the approximation is going to be, uh, but also the longer the time it's going to take. Uh, so, 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 so we, we, when, we, when we started doing this uh, five years ago, we, we, we used to do 500 permutations because that was just manageable. Yeah, but, uh, but like with these large data sets, it was just manageable. Uh, since then, we've, of course, gotten bigger computers. So now we would, by, sta by default, do like a thousand permutations. Um, Recently, there was a, a paper, I've forgotten which journal it was. It, it was from uh, uh, Guillaume Roussier and, um, and, and, and so, so from, from Glasgow and from Edinburgh. They, they looked at the number of permutations. They also compared different methods for uh, permutations versus randomizations versus bootstrapping. Um, and the, 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 their conclusion was that the defaults that, were ha that we have in FieldTrip are actually quite okay. Like they are almost as sensitive as the best method, uh, and, th and they're quite manageable. Hmm? Uh, I, don't, I don't think so. Um, yes, so if, if you want to have the paper, just send me an email, I'll, I'll look it up for you. Okay, so, of course, like the more permutations you do, the, the more accurate it becomes, and it's your responsibility to be confident about your claims. So if you don't feel comfortable about doing a thousand, well then do ten thousand or a hundred thousand. Uh, it just depends what the, whether, we, whether you can fit all of this in, the, in memory because it's, it is a bit memory intense. Okay, so the idea is that we randomize the independent variable. Um, so we say we, we ba basically break the linkage between the condition and the data and then we shuffle. Uh, but the hypothesis that we're phrasing is a hypothesis about the data. It's not about a specific parameter that we're computing out of the data. So basically, this black box can, can compute any parameter. We can compute the difference, the difference in that parameter between any two conditions. Um, and then the randomization distribution is uh, approximated using a Monte Carlo approach, where we take a subset of all possible permutations, or we do an exhaustive, like we compute all possible permutations. And then, uh, yeah, so the null hypothesis is, is, do is tested by comparing the observed statistic versus the randomization distribution. So how does this help us in doing statistics? Well, one thing that it does is that it allows us to uh, make inference independent on the distribution of the statistics. So we, it, it works for, for power, it works for coherence or for other weird measures that we might be deriving from our MEG data. But actually has much 
much more relevant aspect to it, which is that it allows us to uh, avoid the multiple comparison problem. Since the statistic that we're computing can be anything, what we can do is we can, rather than test everything, we can test the most extreme observation. So rather than basically looking everywhere in the brain, we're just going to look at the location where we have the most extreme difference between the two conditions, or where we have the most extreme difference between the two pseudo conditions after shuffling the data. Um, so what we do, in general, is that we compute a randomization distribution for the most extreme statistic. Because if the most extreme statistic is unlikely, then the null hypothesis is rejected. There is one uh, catch here, and that's often we have a, a, st a, a question in which we don't know whether the effect is going to be um, that the data in one condition is going to be larger or that the data in, the other in one condition is going to be smaller. So what we often do is we have two tails that we have to consider. So if I'm saying we're computing the maximum statistic, or if I'm saying that I'm computing the most extreme statistic, what we usually do is we comp compute the most extreme positive statistic and the most extreme negative statistic, which means that we're actually we're doing two randomization tests, one for the most extreme positive and one for the most extreme negative. And we're correcting for those permutation tests using one for only correction allowing for 2.5% on one side of the distribution and 2.5% for the other side of the distribution. Yeah? Okay, so I've shown you that um, the randomization, uh, that non-parametric testing using a randomization approach can be used to um, test data for which we do not know the distribution and that we can use it to circumvent the multiple comparison, multiple comparison problem. But what it also allows us to do is to increase the sensitivity. And that's, of course, very important. So the conventional way of doing statistics is to do a, a massive univariate parametric test. And our approach is to consider the data. Like, we know that in this uh, channel time frequency data, the neighboring channels show the same thing. Uh, neighboring frequency points, they also show the same thing. So what we're doing is we're using the structure that is present in the data to increase the sensitivity. And increasing the sensitivity is done by, uh, by, by sh sh using the, our knowledge about the data, about the data being like neighboring channel time frequency points showing the same thing. So what we do is we, we cluster them. Um, and y you can think of this as that we're accumulating evidence. If one channel is showing an effect, if, if a neighboring channel is also showing the same effect, well then it's, then we consider that to, to, uh, to give additional evidence that there's something going on on, on those channels or on those brain locations of the source analysis. And the same goes with uh, a time and with the frequency domain. We know that there are estimates in the frequency domain that they're spectrally smooth, that there is spectral leakage. So rather than saying, well, each estimate is independent from each other, we just say, well, each estimate is not independent of each other. We expect structure. And again, we're avoiding the multiple comparison problem by compu comparing the largest observed cluster versus the randomization distribution of the largest clusters. So we're still using the maximum statistic or the most extreme statistic, but that's not the most extreme observation, but it's the most extreme cluster. So let me explain this in a bit more detail with uh, the data that we started off with on, on Wednesday afternoon. So it's the, it's the language task, and we already shown is that like f about 400 milliseconds after the onset of an unexpected word in a sentence, there is a, an N400 effect. So what you see here is um, the congruent and the incongruent condition. Uh, and what we can do is we can, for each time point, so this is a hand-picked channel, for each time point we can compute the mean value in both conditions, we compute variance, and we can compute the t-score. So what I show here is actually the t-statistic for each of the time points. And what we can do is we can threshold the t-statistic. So if um, we threshold it without considering multiple comparisons, we would set the threshold approximately at plus two and at minus two. And that would result in these time windows where the data indicates there to be a significant effect. So there's actually quite a lot of time windows, short snippets in time, where the data exceeds this plus two or minus two threshold. If we do a multiple comparison correction, we can correct for the number of time points 
which I think is uh, about 300 or so. Um, and we can correct the alpha level. And we, given that alpha level, we can compute uh, the critical t value, and that critical t value happens to be 4. So if we do a one for only correction, then only this part of the data exceeds the a priori threshold. So that's, that's fine. So that means that with a bond for only correction, we can show that there's a significant effect. But what we do is we take, basically, we take clusters. So what we, what we do is we take the initial a priori chosen threshold of two, and for each of the time windows, we compute the area under the curve. So for each of these small snippets where it exceeds the threshold, we compute the number of time points in the t-value in each time point, we, we add that up. So we integrate it for each of the clusters. And then we take the cluster that has the largest sum of t-values. We, we store that in a distribution. And then we randomly shuffle the data. And we again compute the largest cluster, et cetera, et cetera. And then the cluster, the, so the largest cluster, which is indicated here in gray, is very unlikely given the null hypothesis of the data being exchangeable. So actually, the, the gain that we have in this data is very small. Because if I do a bond for only correction, it's significant. And if I do a cluster-based uh, statistical test, it's also significant. But here I'm cheating because I've already hand-picked a channel. Uh, and of course, I've picked the channel with the largest effect, which is, n which is not fair on the, on the null, null hypothesis. Like on the null hypothesis state, well, there's no effect. Um, so let's now look at the time frequency data. So basically, this is, uh, uh, this is one of the results from the hands-on session that you did uh, yesterday morning. Um, so this is, again, it's a hand-picked channel. We have the time frequency domain. And what we can do is that now plotting gets a bit more difficult. But what we can do is we can, again, compute a t-statistic. And we can threshold the t-statistic to get a binary image. And what I'm showing here is the t-statistic, uh, sorry, is the, the effect thresholded using the t-statistic without correcting for multiple comparisons. So then there you, what you see is that there's multiple small points, like patches, and one large patch uh, in which the, uh, the t-statistic exceeds the a priori chosen threshold. The t-statistic the, the the is basically what we've put in the box. Like we, we, you, you can use an arbitrary statistic. For the, for the, t we, what, the reason why we're quite often using the t-statistic is because we know reasonably well how the t-statistic behaves. So we know that we can have an a priori threshold of 2 and minus 2. You can also take another statistic, but the t-statistic is just one that we, that we happen to know quite well. So, so the, the, the procedure works independent of the statistic, but the statistic, the, like the massive univariate statistic we usually take is the t-statistic. For each randomization, we compute the t-statistic okay, okay. at, e at each channel time frequency point. Uh, and that t-statistic uh, is thresholded. And then given the thresholded data, I, I uh, it, this will hopefully become clear in a, in a few slides from now. But then given the thresholded data, we identify the clusters. And then for each cluster, we compute the weight in that cluster. I, it, it will become clear in a, in a few slides from now. OK, so this is the. Uh, the data thresholded at a t-value of 2. If we apply a bond-for-only correction here, then none of the time frequency point actually has a t-value that is sufficiently large to exceed the threshold. If we do the cluster-based test, then this is the cluster that is unlikely given the null hypothesis. So already in with single-channel time frequency data, uh, the cluster-based test uh, is, is clearly outperforming a bond-for-only correction. And the situation gets even more obvious that it, this is a very sensitive test if we move to channel time frequency, so if we also add a channel dimension. Visualizing the data gets a bit challenging because these, these clusters, they basically have, have a spatial, a temporal, uh, and, a, uh, and, a, and, a, and a frequency aspect to them. What we, what we can do is we can, again, here, for sp specific time windows, where now I'm now zooming in on the, on the beta effect, so what I've done is I've for specific time windows, I've plotted the spatial topography in the beta band. And what you see is that the beta topography is changing over time. Um, we can compute t-values. We can threshold this. 
and there is this cluster that is exceeding the threshold. So one thing that you might notice is that this is not really a, a physiologically interpretable cluster because it's, it starts like at a early latencies on the right side and then it moves towards the left side. But we're not making assumptions that the clusters are physiologically interpretable. The cluster is just what we put inside the black box. And the method is valid regardless of what's in the black box. So we, we, we can put me physiologically meaningful stuff in the black box. And of course these clusters can have some interpretation. But I think it's important that you realize that you should not be interpreting the clusters. You should be interpreting the data. The, statistic is a, the statistical test is a test about the data. It's not a statistical test about the clusters. We're just using, we're exploiting the clusters to increase sensitivity. So to give, me a to, to give a toy example. So what we have, let's say we have observed uh, 10 different subjects in a condition A and a condition B. Uh, so we have, for each of them, we have a, an event-related potential or a time frequency distribution. And what we do is we randomly shuffle, so under the null hypothesis, the conditions are the same. So that means that under the null hypothesis, I can shuffle the data over the two conditions. And of course, this shuffling, where possible, we will do it pairwise. So if we have observed uh, 10 subjects, each subject in two conditions, so we're only going to shuffle the data within the subject. So we go basically, we're going to do a sort of a paired t-test or, or paired shuffling. Um, and that's something that we can repeat many times. Um, and then what we have is we, we can look at the spatial topography of the effect. Um, so this is the original assignment. What we would, for example, observe is that there is a, a group of connected channels. Here the, the channels are uh, uh, s s indicated schematically, but we, we, you can specify the neighborhood structure. So you can specify which channels you consider to be neighbors of each other. And what we'd have is all well, these channels are exceeding the threshold. So then for these channels, I would look at the t value, I would sum the t value, and I would put that in my table as an observation. Then I shuffle, I again take the largest cluster, I put it in the table. And that is something that I do multiple times. So that's basically the idea that we form the distribution of the maximum statistic. And there's quite a lot of choices that you can make. So like one of the choices that we already addressed is like how many permutations should you, should you make. But you can also make choices such as like how do I compute the, the, the aggregated confidence by, by summing over the cluster. So you can take the, what, what, what we normally do is we take, the mean, uh, we take the sum of the t values over the cluster. You can also take the mean. Uh, you can also take the maximum value within the cluster. So basically there's a whole bunch of choices. Um, they, they will affect the statistical sensitivity, but they do not uh, affect the validity of the statistical test. Because that's all, all th those are all choices that you make within this black box. Um, let, let's postpone this question for a moment, okay? So what I, so if I've done, done ma many of these permutations, I've computed something that I considered evidence in favor of my alternative hypothesis. Um, I just look at where my observed statistic is in, in this distribution. So to summarize, what we have is we have a, we can do parametric statistical models for many channel time frequency points. Um, where we compute the probability given the null hypothesis, uh, w where we are formally doing one null hypothesis for each channel time frequency point, giving a massive multiple comparison problem. With using the non-parametric approach, what we have is we use randomization or permutation. Permutation is just a subset of all possible randomization, so, but usually we do a permutation, and then from all possible permutations we're taking a subset uh, to keep it computationally tractable. The probability of the null hypothesis can be computed given an arbitrary statistic uh, that allows us to incorporate prior knowledge into this statistic. Um, and it also allows us to avoid the multiple comparison uh, problem using this, using this prior knowledge. 
Okay, so this is, I, I, so far I've been explaining everything for, for the channel level, uh, but the same thing holds for the source level. Um, and, and I think it, it is valuable, that it, it is important that with MEG data that we go to the source level. Like that's the whole point of having a, a whole channel, uh, a whole head, uh, many channel MEG system. So this, for, for source level, the same principles apply. Um, and the idea is that for beam forming, for example, they would, would swap the data be between the conditions. However, if we, if we do that, if we just swap the data at the channel level, and then we compute spatial filters and we compute the beam former distribution of power all in this black box, that's computationally, it's very expensive. Because it's like a beam form analysis will take a second, or a few seconds, maybe five seconds. Which means that if you have to do a thousand randomizations, you're looking at some serious computational time. So that's why we can consider actually how this beam form formulation works, and that's where, where the common filters come in. Um, so let me first explain a little bit how, how, how we organize the data. So what we have, we have, we have data we observed in two conditions. Um, and if we're considering the data at the source level, then what we have is, for example, a three-dimensional volume. And this three-dimensional volume has dimensions along the x and the y and the z direction. And what we can do is we can reshape this into one very long vector. And that is how it's, how it's internally done in these, in these functions. Um, each of the elements of this vector is basically is one voxel. So what I then can do is I can plot the data in the two conditions like this. So I have, I have my observation in one condition, I have my observation in the other condition. Uh, this is one condition, this is another condition. And given these volumes in each of the conditions, I can compute a T volume. Like I can compute a statistical parametric map. And of course the idea is that we, I would shuffle the data between the two conditions and I would do that many times. And every time I would compute this T value. Um, so, given this volume of T values, so giving like which I can again reshape into uh, into this into this whole brain grid representation, I can set an upward threshold and I can cluster neighboring voxels. And again, I can compute the sum over the clusters. So, if we now return to beam forming, um, under the null hypothesis, I'm I'm claiming that the data comes from the same distribution, that the data is the same. So although this is one condition, under the null hypothesis, the data in both conditions is coming from the same distribution. So that means that rather than computing a spatial filter for one, under the null hypothesis, the best spatial filter that I would be able to compute would be the one in which I use both data sets. So let's look at the mathematics here. So yesterday, Joanna showed that we have this forward model, so the channel level data is the lead field times the sources plus noise. And what we do is we compute a sp the estimated source, which is a spatial filter times the channel level data, where the spatial filter is computed like this. And the spatial filter has the lead field in it and has the source, uh, sorry, has the channel covariance matrix in it. Right? I, I might be using slightly different letters than Joanna used yesterday, but the, 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 like the, the structure of the equation should be clear for you. Okay, so what we have is we have um, the covariance matrix. And the covariance matrix is basically uh, the data times the data transposed divided by the number of data points. What we also have is the power, the source level power. And the source level power is basically it's the source level time series times the source level time series transposed. It's the variance of the source. Um, and if I just, rather than taking these, I can also take these, actually just, um, I'm, I'm inconsistent here myself because this should have been a W. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so, but <coughs> what I have is I have W times Y times Y transposed times W transposed. Because what I'm doing is I'm using this equation to fill in here. So that means that if I consider the covariance matrix, well, the covariance matrix is basically it's the sum of the covariance matrices or the average of the covariance matrix over all files. So the covariance matrix, the average covariance matrix, is basically is this one. Of course, I can try to compute single trial beam formers, but my covariance matrix, is, uh, my, the estimate of my covariance is very poor. So single trial beam formers are extremely noisy. So that's why we always compute beam formers on the average covariance matrix or on the 
average cross spectral density matrix. So, but if so, here, and here you see the averaging over all the trials. But the nice thing is that if I take the average cross spectral density or covariance matrix in computing the filters, I can very easily compute single trial power by rather than here taking the power for the average cross spectral density matrix, I just multiply my filters with a single trial covariance matrix. So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm sp splitting the, 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 the problem into estimating the filters and estimating the power. And that means that given the null hypothesis that the data is coming from the same distribution, I have the best spatial filter that I can compute is the one where I've averaged all of the data covariance into one covariance matrix. And then given the covariance matrix in each individual trial, I can compute the power in each individual trial. And if I can compute the power in each individual trial, that's and then that's done just by a simple multiplication, I can very easily get uh, start shuffling these trials. Yeah? So, so my, my single trial power estimates will still be relatively noisy. But if I, let's go back here. So what I'm doing here in the computation of the filter, I'm taking the inverse of the covariance matrix. Taking the inverse of a very noisy covariance matrix is going to give an extremely unstable uh, inverse. So that means that the spatial filter that I can compute, like this, the computation of the spatial filter is a nonlinear operation. The spatial filter that I can compute for a single trial is going to be extremely noisy. The spatial that the filter that I compute for all the trials together is quite a stable filter. The multiplication of the spatial filter with the single trial covariance, that's a linear operation. So the average of my single trial power given a common filter is the same as the spatially filtered average data because that's a linear operation. But it's, it's the, no, the nonlinear operation of, com of the computation of the spatial filter that is sensitive to this noise, to this, to this poor estimate of the noise. Yeah? Okay, so with source level statistics, we, we, we basically we're using the same principles as for channel level statistics. Um, we start, and it's it basically it's a two-step approach, and that's also what you've seen yesterday in the in the in the hands-on. So we we start with this. We start with an average covariance over all the data to get the spatial filter. Um, we have one spatial filter for each of the voxels, uh, and under the null hypothesis, that spatial filter is not going to be different. So best to compute one spatial filter, and that allows us to do single trial estimates by just a simple multiplication. So that means that we can compute single trial power quite robustly for a thousand different uh, randomizations of the data. And, it, and, it's and it's also fast, like that's only a few, like a, like a minute or so. Um, the permutation test, however, is, is not affected. Uh, because we, what we assume is that we, ex we assume exchangeability of the data over the conditions. But if we exchange the data over the conditions, the spatial filter doesn't change which means that it's perfectly fine to compute the spatial filter in advance. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's computationally fast. So to, uh, to wrap up, um, what, I've, what I've shown is that we have a method for testing a formal hypothesis, uh, which allows us to control the chance of false alarms. And that, that's important because uh, although we, we take the risk if we're publishing a paper that we're that is that's basically that the finding cannot be reproduced by others. We don't want to publish too many papers that cannot be reproduced, right? Um, so we, we have to control the, the, the chance of us making false claims. Um, but at the same time, we also don't want to be overly conservative. Like if you're using a bond Peroni correction at the channel level, then you'll never publish a paper. And that's also not good. Um, so we want to control the false, we want to not have not too many false positives but you also don't constantly want to have false negatives. And that's why the increase of the sensitivity is such an important aspect. The multiple comparison problem 
uh, mainly comes about by having one hypothesis per channel time frequency point or one hypothesis per voxel. And the way that the cluster-based randomization test circumvents the multiple comparison problem is that it replaces multiple comparisons by a single one. So by taking the, the value of the maximum cluster. And that is a, a valid approach because if we reject on all hypotheses, then we know that the alternative hypothesis holds, which means that the data is different. And we increase the sensitivity by not taking only the maximum statistic, but by taking the, the sum of the values within the largest cluster. And as, as such, this is a, although we start with a massive univariate uh, statistical uh, map, uh, we are combining values over multiple voxels. So it, it is a sort of a multivariate analysis that we're doing inside this black box. Um, there's, I, I think there's, there's, there's two more important aspects to mention. And the, the first is that um, we're making an assumption about the data being exchangeable under the null hypothesis, and w which means that if, the, if we reject the null hypothesis, we, we can firmly conclude that the data is not exchangeable. It, it does not necessarily instruct us what the feature in the data is where the data differs. So a lot of people have the tendency to say, well, I have a significant cluster. Well, it's not the cluster that is significant. It's you have, you have significant effect allowing you to reject a null hypothesis. There is a difference in the data, and the difference is expressed in the cluster. But it's not only the cluster where this different di difference happens. And that's especially obvious if you, if you consider channel-level data. So of course, th you will have a source somewhere in the brain projected towards the scalp, and on the scalp, some channels will show a large effect. So if you threshold the scalp level data, then on those channels you're going to find a cluster, and on the basis of those, on, on the basis of that cluster, you're going to reject the null hypothesis that the data is exchangeable. But if you find an effect on a few channels, well, you know that the source is projecting to all channels. It's just projecting more strongly to, to some channels and more weakly to other channels. So you should not interpret that cluster as having the signific significant effect. The significant effect is actually in the brain, it's not on the channels. And in principle, if you had recorded more data, if you had recorded more trials, then the cluster would have gotten larger. Like you would have been able to show on more, more channels that would, that would be an effect. So this, this thresholding, this clustering, you should not take it as an interpretation of what the, what the data, uh, what the difference in the data is. So the, the decision that you make in rejecting the null hypothesis is still relatively independent from you interpreting the difference in the data. And that, that's an important step. Like it's the in interpretation of the findings is different from the statistics. Statistics is only a tool to help you make an informed decision. But statistics is not a tool for you interpreting the data. The second point to make is that I've always been talking about um, ex exchanging data between two conditions. And uh, you already came up with the idea, like, so how, if we ha how about uh, like a more an ANOVA type of model with, with multiple factors or a repeated measures ANOVA? What I'm, what I'm saying is, that wha what, I'm, what I'm stating is that we have a hypothesis that is not dependent on the parameter in the data. So once we start doing ANOVAs, Actually, we are assuming a model of the data. We are assuming parameters of the data. We're assuming that the data can be described using the mean value and using variances. So that means that, the, in general, the model of an ANOVA is incompatible with a non-parametric test, because an ANOVA is a parametric model. And it means that it, usually if you do an ANOVA, you're, you're not interested in the main effects, but you're interested in the interaction. And that interaction only applies if you assume that you have a linear model. So that means that, in principle, an ANOVA is incompatible with a non-parametric test such as this. However, there's a workaround. So what, we, what you can do is you can do a first-level uh, descriptive statistical computation of your interaction effect. And then on the second level, you can test whether that interaction effect is, um, wh for example, whether the sign of that interaction effect is exchangeable. So what we, what we often do is we do a, a two-tiered approach where on the first level we compute a descriptive statistic and on the second level we do the inferential statistic given the first level statistic. So the first level statistic would be the, um, would be the interaction and the second level statistic would be whether that interaction is consistently 
whether if we flip the sign of that interaction, whether that would be the same. Because under the null hypothesis, the interaction would have a random sign. Like would it would be positive in some, negative, like positive for some randomizations, negative for, for some others. Um, so that's that's basically the, the the trick that we use to to test uh, parametric models. So it's still a non-parametric test, but using the w if the, if in the parametric model, if you use that in the first level of the test, and then you can take the first level statistic to the second level, and at the second level, we do the statistical inference. Yeah, but you know, but, it, but it's it, it, the interpretation is is invalid. Because the interpretation is an imp interpretation about the data, not about the model that you're testing. So, so, so with, with this, you, you, so, so what, 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 we, what we can do is we can show that the data is not exchangeable, but you still don't know whether there's an interaction effect. Because although, although you're computing the interaction effect as the statistic, it, that you, you, it's, it's the same as like if, if we reject the null hypothesis on the basis of the cluster, it's not that the cluster is meaning something, there's something different in the data. So that's, that, so that's why it is important to uh, understand that the, 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 st the, the statistical procedure is rejecting the null hypothesis. And the null hypothesis is not about a parameter. So the null hypothesis is not about the interaction effect. The null hypothesis is not about the mean values. The null hypothesis is about exchangeability of data. So that, and, and, and that null hypothesis does not change. So if you compute an interaction effect, if you compute a repeated meshes ANOVA, it's not going to change the null effect, uh, sorry, the null hypothesis. Which means if you reject the null hypothesis, you still don't know anything about uh, the interaction in, in, in between the two main effects. But if you change the data that goes into the hypothesis, then you can become sensitive for the interaction effect. So that's why, the, why this two-tiered approach is important. 